And if you are three years old through the third grade and would like to go to junior church, we'll let you make your way out the center doors back there. Pastor Sands, could you help me out? I have a sheet back on the front desk. Can we get four guys there? I mentioned to you that we are studying through the life of Christ as uh, not particularly one book, but as we go uh, through uh, the book, we'll, we'll pick up the events that are taking place in, in his life. And I'd like you to have another sheet this morning to look at because uh, sometimes there's a question here uh, that I think would be good for you to know the answer to. And so this is a, uh, a sheet that has the parallel passages on it, and I'll explain that in just a minute. <clears throat> but as they're doing that, let me give you a little bit of an introduction to what, <coughs> excuse me, to where we are in the passage, or in the life of the Lord Jesus. As we come to Mark chapter 9, we're actually in the last half of his life. Um, not just the last half of his life, but we're in the last six months of his ministry. And he's coming to the place where he really needs to refine the disciples so that they can serve him effectively. And so some of the lessons that he's teaching them are lessons that you and I need to grasp as well. And in this passage, he's going to deal with greatness. How do you become great? Now, if you'll take that sheet and for just a moment, if you'll just put it aside, that's probably the best thing to do. Uh, Michael, we still need them up here, back to here. You will want to look at that in just a minute, so don't put it too far away. Everyone have one? Okay. All right, let's go back to uh, Mark chapter 9 and uh, let's look at verse 33 again. Mark chapter 9, verse 33. It says, And he came to, to Caper Capernaum, and being in the house, he asked them, What is it you disputed among yourselves? By the way, apparently the Lord was not with them when this conversation took place. Um, we don't know if it was while he was on the mountain during the transfiguration or exactly when it took place, but most likely he was away and possibly at the transfiguration. But there was a discussion that took place among the disciples when Jesus was not with them. And he's going to get the core of that discussion from them. Now, on the paper that you have, let me have you look at that for a moment and let me explain what you're looking at. And it will help you, um, as you um, uh, as you look at this, you'll see that there are, are three columns there, actually four columns, three columns with, um, with passages at the top. When I say a parallel passage, let me make sure you understand what a parallel passage is. Your Bible is divided into the Old Testament and New Testament. The Old Testament is what we would call the Old Covenant. And that old covenant is a covenant that God had with man, that he was uh, to keep the law. And there's a lot more to it, but if he kept the law, he would be righteous. The problem with that old covenant was that man found out he could not keep that covenant. He could not be righteous based upon his own keeping of the law. When you come to the New Testament, we're going to get the new covenant. And the new covenant is an agreement whereby God says, if you will believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you will obtain righteousness through him. And the new covenant or the new agreement is that when you come to a place where you realize your sinfulness, you realize I can't keep God's law, I need help, and you turn to Christ and you say, will you help me? He said, I will do that. Now, how does he help you? He helps you by taking your sin and placing it upon himself. He pays the penalty for your sin. When Christ died on the cross, he didn't die for his sin. He kept the law. He was sinless. And so when he died, he did not die as a result of his sin. He died as a result of your sin and my sin. 
And so, what has to happen in order for you to be saved from the penalty of your sin is that you have to come to the place where under this new agreement, what we have is the New Testament in our Bible, under this new agreement, you've come to God and said, I want that agreement. I want to trust Christ as my Savior. I want to trust that my sin is placed upon him and his righteousness is placed upon me. He says, okay, based upon this agreement, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. With the heart man believes, resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made, resulting in salvation. If you in your heart and with your mouth confess this, then you will have salvation, you will be righteous. So you're not righteous based upon keeping the law. You are righteous based upon the righteousness of Christ. He became sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in or through him. I am righteous because of Jesus Christ, because of what he's done. He's given me righteousness. That's the New Testament. Now, in the, the old covenant or the old agreement, we found out we couldn't keep the law. Under the new covenant, which you have in your Bible, the new agreement, you can be saved if you would like to be saved. You can, under that agreement, enter into an agreement with God. In that New Testament, we have the first four books, which are the Gospels. And the Gospels are four different accounts of the life of Christ. I had a guy call this week, and, and he called under the pretense that he wanted to know some things about our church. And, and so he, I said, okay, are there some specific things you'd like to know? And, and he gave me an opportunity to just tell him, and I told him a little bit about our church. I said, well, well, what is it you're wanting to know? Well, it became pretty obvious to me soon into the conversation, he, that really wasn't why he called. He called because he wanted to argue. And so this guy, uh, I don't know who he is, and I, I hope the Lord helps him see some, some things, but he started telling me, uh, all about his view of versions, and, and he started telling me about uh, how the Bible was wrong, and the, the, the Old Testament authors plagiarized, and, and I mean, he just went on and on and on about things. And you know, his argument was that, that Paul didn't believe in the virgin birth of Christ because Paul never mentioned it. And when he took a breath, I said, you're arguing from silence. The fact that he didn't say it doesn't mean he doesn't believe it. Well, that started another you know, line of argument from him. And then he went back to the Old Testament. You know those guys plagiarized, right? There's one guy that actually copied exactly from another guy. And I said, yes, I know that. And that doesn't bother you? And I said, no. That really set him off. Poor guy. So he went on and on. Finally, I said, look, you called to ask about the church. Are there any other questions you'd like for me to answer? And he hung up. This poor guy didn't understand the basics of the Bible. He didn't understand that sometimes there are books that are written for specific purposes. Go back to those Old Testament books he's talking about. One of those books was written very specifically to the southern kingdom, and he copied some of the things the other guy put down. He didn't say he didn't. They didn't have uh, the rules that we have about you know, footnoting and giving credit. They, they would often copy from each other. In the New Testament, often, this guy didn't do it, but often people will say, if you read the four accounts, they don't match up. That's not true. Number one, we're not always sure we're reading the same account. A lot of things happened in the Lord's life in three years. Here is an example of when we, we figure, we think that he's probably talking about the same instance and three different guys record it. So in this case, Matthew, Mark, and Luke record the same instance. John does not record this uh, particular instance. So if you'll go to this, I read for you just a moment ago that in Mark chapter uh, 9, if you'll look at the four columns, there are three columns there, the first three columns, I read to you verse 33. And he came to Capernaum, and being in the house, he asked, or began to question them, what is it that you disputed among yourselves by the way? What were you discussing on the way? But if you go back to Luke, and you'll see, I've tried to put them in order. If you go over to the third column, Luke says, then there arose a reasoning, and that's an argument among them, which of them should be the greatest. So Luke probably steps back a little further, and he says, they got to arguing about Who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom? Wow, what an argument. 
Now understand that in their minds, they're thinking an earthly kingdom. They do not have a kingdom of, of God in mind. They don't have the kingdom of heaven, uh, the kingdom of Christ in mind. They're still thinking earthly kingdom like David had. Solomon reigned over that Christ is going to institute this kingdom and they're going to be uh, his minions in this kingdom. They're going to rule with him. And so their argument was, who's going to be the greatest? Oh, obviously Christ is going to be the head, but who's going to be next to him in power? And so these guys are actually arguing about this. And at some point, uh, the Lord came and he said, hey, what were you guys talking about when you were on the way here? I go to verse 34. But they held their peace, or they kept silent. For by, or on the way, they had disputed among themselves who should be the greatest, which of them was the greatest. Now, interestingly, if you look at the first column, Matthew chapter 18, verse 1, here's where somebody would say they don't match up. Because Matthew says, at the same time came the disciples unto Jesus, saying, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And somebody would say, well, there you go. Matthew says that the disciples came and asked Jesus who's the greatest in the kingdom of heaven, and the others say they were arguing about it. No. You often do that. You could pick a conversation up in the middle. And my impression of this is very simply that as Jesus Christ began to talk to them, he said, hey, what were you guys talking about as we traveled? And they all kept silent. Well, you know, we just have a little conversation. Well, what were you talking about? Well, you know, we were just talking about the weather. And, you know. No, what else? Specifically, what were you talking about? Well, Lord, who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Well, there's the question. And Matthew apparently picks the story up right there. He doesn't give us the, the preceding actions where there was a discussion among the disciples. It's not a conflict. It's just that Matthew chooses to pick the story up there. Go back to your, your chart and you'll see then verse 35. And he, this is Jesus, sat down and called the twelve and said unto them, if any man desire or wants to be first, the same shall be last of all and servant of all. Now, I've got that in bold because that is the center of what we're looking at. That is the message that Jesus Christ wanted to get across to those of us who are reading, those of us who are peering in on this story. He says, here's what you need to understand. This is the singular message that I want you to get out of this. If any man desires or wants to be first, the same shall be or needs to be last of all and servant of all. You're not going to be first until you're last. You're not going to be served until you learn to serve. That's the core message, and boy, does that have a lot of implications. Now, keep going in this. In, in verse 36 of Matthew 9, and he took a child and set him in the midst of them, set him before them, and when he had taken him in his arms, he said unto them. Now, let's stop there for a moment because you'll see that over in Luke, we have the same thing, Jesus perceiving the thought. Now, there's something that we don't have in the others. Uh, here is something I point out fairly often, uh, knowing what they were thinking, knowing what was in their heart. You don't hide your thoughts and your motives more. Uh, that, that is something you just need to come to grips with. The things that you think you're hiding from God, you're not hiding from God. He knew what was in their minds and he knew what was in their heart. It's an open book to him. And so as you get involved in those sinful activities that you think are private, you may have hid, hidden them from everybody else, but you haven't hidden them from God. Don't ever deceive yourself like that, thinking that God doesn't know what's going on in either your heart or your mind. He knows that. And, and then all three of them record that he took a child and set him by him, or he stood him by his side. Now, I need to give you one other piece of historical evidence, or not evidence, but information here, in order to understand. You and I have a, a high regard for children. As a matter of fact, our children are too highly regarded. There are many places where children run the home. And by the way, that's wrong for your, your children to do that. Uh, the family center around the children. And one of the reasons that marriages fall apart is because the, the home centers around the children. 
There are too many children that run the home. The home is to be run by, by dad, the relationship with mom. It is to be flowed down from that. The, if your child is the center of everything, you've got problems looming in multiple ways. You and I live in a culture like that. Children's rights, and we, we take our kids to soccer and camps and do all kinds of things, and we really pamper them. The Roman culture was the opposite of that. Children were dirt. Children were slaves. Even your own children, until they got to a certain age, they really were nothing. Uh, if a child was in your way, you shoved him out of the way, that would be common. Children were down here, adults were up here, and children were, were, were not thought of highly at all. It was really not a culture where they, they took care of children, where we would have a vacation Bible school and, you know, I love children, have them in, I give them Tic Tacs out of my alligator and all kinds of different things. That wouldn't be the way a Roman would do it. And so when Jesus does this, when he's with the group and he takes this child and he brings them over and he stands him by his side, they're like, what's he doing paying attention to a kid? Uh, their kids are just, you know, they're just kids. I don't know why he's got a kid up there. Well, he's going to teach him a lesson from this. Um, in verse 36, he says, he took the child and set him in the midst of them, probably uh, took him ahead and stand there and set, up, set them. And it makes an interesting statement. And when he had taken him in his arms, he said unto them. Now, I, I've tried to visualize this. Uh, just exactly what is this? Did he, did he have this child? I don't know how old the child is, but... But he has this child come up, and does he take him in his arms and just kind of hold him like that, or does he put him beside him and put his arm around him? I don't know. But there was obvious affection from the Lord to this child. That was completely culturally different from what they would expect a, a man to do. And then he says, I need you to get a lesson out of this, what I'm doing. In order to really get the lesson, look at the first column, Matthew chapter 18, and look at verse 3. And he said, Verily, verily, or said, Verily, I say unto you, unless, except you be converted and become as little children, you shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoso shall receive one such little child in my name receives me. But whoso shall offend one of these little ones which believe in me causes, or the idea that causes one of these little ones who believe in me to stumble, it were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and that he were drowned in the depth of the sea. A millstone is that big, heavy, uh, stone that has some kind of hole in the center and they would roll it around to grind the wheat, to separate the wheat and the chaff. They're used for different things, but it's a massive stone. It would outweigh any man. And he said, you would be better off to hang that around your neck and drop your, it into the depth of the sea with you hooked to it than to offend one of these little ones who believe in me. What's he saying by that? I think very highly of these children who believe in me. We've just come through Vacation Bible School, and I am absolutely convinced that when, when you work in Vacation Bible School, and sometimes you get a little bit weary, a little bit tired from it, the Lord was seeing all of that. Because when the Lord talks about children, he does not have the perspective of the Romans where he says, yeah, rubber acts running around. He says, there's one of mine. And he said, if you're ever going to be anything in God's kingdom, you're going to have to develop some characteristics that they have. There's humility. And he was talking about the humility they evidenced. They knew who was in charge. They knew their position. And he said, unless you be converted and become as these little children, unless you change your minds and become, uh, start thinking like these little children think, you're not going to amount to anything. What's he mean by that? Well, if we look at this passage, that gives you the idea of what happened in this whole scenario that took place. 
Here are the disciples arguing with one another and trying to figure out who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom. And, and then when the Lord asked them about it, he sits them down and says, we need to get a really clear lesson out here. And here's the lesson. The lesson is, if you want to achieve greatness, I need to help you understand how to do that. Because you've fallen prey to secular thinking. And in secular thinking, they teach that you're going to be great a different way than from a heavenly perspective. So let's make sure that you and I get the same lesson that the Lord taught. Over in the fourth column, just because I was giving you a piece of paper, I've given you a couple of notes. And if you want to write some things down, you can. If you don't have a pen, you don't need it. But if you like to scribble, that will give you something to scribble on. If you want to make a paper airplane, don't fly it until the service is over. Uh, but here, here are the things that we need to, to understand. Let's put them under this topic. Three components to correctly defining greatness. If I'm going to correctly define greatness, what is involved in that? You know, the big news this week was about LeBron James. How many of you know who LeBron James is? Oh, yeah, most of you do. I am not a professional basketball fan at all. I, matter of fact, I don't think I even watched the, the tournament this year. I, usually I'll watch one game of it and say, okay, I watched a little bit of it. I might have gotten a few minutes of one this year just so I could say I watched it. I don't even remember doing that. But So I'm not a professional basketball fan. But LeBron James is an interesting guy. Recruited right out of high school. Uh, he's like 6'10", 250 pounds, and he's been the MVP several times. Never went to college, but he's a phenomenal basketball player. Well, when he was recruited, uh, or he was drafted, he, he went to Cleveland. And uh, the Cleveland, Cleveland what? Cleveland Cavaliers? Cavaliers. <coughs> Cleveland Cavaliers, and he played there at the beginning of his career. And he did well. I mean, he was the MVP up there, I think, once or twice, and, and they never won a championship. But, but he was a, obviously, he's an exceptional ball player. I think he could even beat me. Um, <laughs> so, you know, this guy was great. Well, four years ago, they were burning LeBron James shirts in the streets. I remember that. It was bad. Because LeBron James decided to go to the Miami Heat. 2010, they, Sports, uh, or, uh, yeah, Sports Illustrated and, and uh, um, ESPN did a special one night, got huge ratings, and, and here's LeBron James, and he was announcing on live TV where he was going to go. And he said, I'm taking my talents to South Beach, and he went to the Miami Heat. It was an interesting reasoning behind it, because uh, LeBron James wanted a ring. Well, what's the ring? The ring is the championship ring. Everybody wants the championship ring. Uh, people want to be on top. They want to be recognized by other people. They want to uh, have people know that they're in charge, know who they are. And that's what LeBron James wanted. I'm going to use him uh, a couple of times as an example in, in, this, in this message. Because greatness is something that people would like to have. But, but figuring out what greatness is, is often the difficult thing for us to do. <clears throat> well, what we learn when we come to this is that there are three components to greatness. Here's component number one. And I'm going to have to say that we put it down like this. That people naturally desire greatness. People naturally desire greatness. I always put people carnally desire greatness. But I don't think that's right. I think we naturally desire greatness. And I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. There is the natural motivation that we have to accomplish things. It is what we want to be great in that becomes problematic. Uh, when uh, when uh, LeBron James decided to go to Miami, there were two other guys, Chris, Chris Bosch and Dwayne Wade, that also went. Uh, they went to the Miami Heat and uh, they, they played there for four years. In those four years, they got two rings. They won two championships. But I read something interesting the other day in the Washington Post. Matter of fact, it was last night or this morning that I read this. It was the advice to the people from Miami. And this writer was saying, instead of lamenting what they lost, the Heat and its fans should celebrate what they gained. 
James had a historic run in South Beach for both the Heat and the NBA. It was a wonderful period made possible because professional sports' biggest star, and listen to this, hungered to achieve the ultimate team success. LeBron James just has the same exact desire that most people have. He wanted to achieve success. He wanted to be on top. If he was going to play basketball, he wanted to be on a championship team. And that desire for greatness, that desire for success, is a huge motivator in people's lives. If you read the news this week, there's another story that's been prominent this week, and that is that Romney continues to weigh a 2016 run for president. Now, I hope he doesn't. I, I struggle with the man. I, I think he has some good things. For him. But why would anyone run for president? Let me tell you what you get when you're president of the United States. You get $400,000. That's your salary. Now, how many of you would like $400,000? Okay, all right. Now, I mean, what I'm saying, you only get $400,000. We're kind of, okay, that's not bad. But with it, you get the Secret Service. You know why you get the Secret Service? <laughs> There are people trying to kill you. And it's for life you get the Secret Service. You get to live in a big house with a bunker because somebody might bomb you. You get guns on the roof. You get a lot with it. I mean, have you ever looked at the presidents from the time that they go into office until they come out four years or eight years later? Woo! White heads, wrinkles. I mean, those guys look rough after that time. And they're constantly dealing with problems and, and the press is out. You can't please people, especially now. You can't, you, nobody's happy with you. I mean, when I start describing this job, why would you want that job? The presidents of corporations that are smaller than the United States make millions every year. Millions and millions every year. You get 400,000. Now you get your own jet. And you get to take a few taxpayer paid trips. Play golf. Play golf. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Why would you want that job? Why would anyone consider running for it after they've lost twice? Because people desire greatness. Now, there's genuinely a desire in people that want to help the United States, and I believe that. There are some people that God has called to that. And I think God gives us leaders who will, uh, can be a blessing to our country. And so uh, I wouldn't discount, if you came to me and said I'm running for president, I would tell you, a lot of problems there, and I hope the Lord uses you in it. But, but if you're just simply desiring greatness, this is a natural desire. And here are the disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ, and they have exactly the same desire that every person has. And you wouldn't think within a, what I'm going to call Christian ministry, that you would have that, but you do. And you know, in reality, even in good Christian ministries, you sometimes have people with egos who want to be great. And I have appreciated that about our people here, that there's not that desire for greatness and that desire to be seen by people. But that is a, a, a natural desire. And here's this desire coming out in the Lord's disciples, in his own people who've been traveling with him. Let me go to component number two here. Component number two is the people sense that this carnal desire is misdirected. Now, I've called it a carnal desire here because in this case, it was a carnal desire. In this case, it was something that they were, were really out of line and trying to figure out who can get the best position. And so when the Lord asked them, hey, what were you guys discussing on the way. In verse 34 of Mark 9, that's when it says they kept silence. They kept their peace, the help of peace. These guys knew that there was something wrong. Did you ever play King of the Hill? I never had a long, uh, did a lot, but, but we would once in a while. We have a great dirt pile. Dirt pile is good for anything. Uh, you know, we used that dirt pile in the church picnic. We, we, we had the kids climbing it. Pastor Sands had a slip and slide down it. I mean, a dirt pile is just like the, the perfect toy. One of the things they haven't played yet that I know of is King of the Hill. And play King of the Hill is that you have a group of people and the objective is to be standing on top of the hill. And when somebody's on top of the hill, what are they doing? What's everybody else doing? 
trying to knock you off the top. You become everyone's enemy when you get to be king of the hill. If you get knocked off the hill, the next guy who's up there becomes everybody's enemy. It's kind of a fun game. And, and so over and over, people are trying to be king of the hill and fend off the people who are coming to get them. But here's this carnal desire. People realize that this is actually kind of a carnal desire to want to be the king of the hill. You have to really watch that. You have to watch this natural desire that it doesn't become a carnal desire in you. There is this self uh, uh, exaltation where, in essence, we would never say this, but we want people to notice us and worship us. I want people to say, here's how great I am. And you want your 15 minutes of fame because you want accolades from people. And that's what his disciples were struggling with. I want people to know who I am. I want people to, to look at me and say, wow, he's pretty special. And here's this sense, though, that they understand this is a carnal desire and it's a misdirected desire. I know, I just sense that what I have and what I'm doing is not what is pleasing to the Lord. And many times you come up with that as well. You recognize that in your own heart and in your own mind, there's a carnality that creeps forward when you want to exalt yourself. You want that exaltation because you want people to see you. You're pointing people to you, not to the Lord. That takes us to the third component. And component number three is the big con component. And I'm going to, put it, going to put it in a negative statement. Here it is. People define greatness in the context of temporal values. People define greatness in the context of temporal values. What are temporal, temporal values? Uh, temporal as opposed to eternal. Most people define greatness as though they had gotten everything that they wanted. Somebody's great because they've accomplished something. We look at LeBron James and we say, that guy's got two championship rings. Man, he's great. I mean, do you ever really think about that? Th this guy's really good at going out and bouncing a rubber ball and getting him to go through an iron ring. And we pay him, uh, they're paying him $42.2 million to do that for the next two years. I would take that. Yeah to play basketball. But here's greatness. And we define greatness as somebody who has achieved on a temporal level some really good things. And in the minds of the disciples, they were still defining greatness in the context of temporal values. When the Lord sets up his throne in Jerusalem, when the Lord finally makes those Romans bow the knee to us, hey, which one of us is going to be his right hand man? Which one of us is going to be next in line to him? They're still defining greatness in temporal terms, in the context of temporal values. And that's where the Lord said, guys, let's redefine greatness. Let's make sure that you and every Christian that follows after us understands what true greatness is. Let's make sure that you don't get confused thinking that the guy who has the biggest church is the greatest. That you don't think that the, the, the lady who can sing the best is the greatest. That you don't think that the one who is most public is the greatest. Because I want you to understand what greatness truly is. And it's at that point in verse 35 that he looks at his disciples and said, here's greatness. If you want to be first, then you be last of all and serve them. Those who are really first are those who are going to be servants of all. They're not going to be the ones that are in the long run. And as the Lord teaches this, that's probably shocking to his disciples. That's not the way they were thinking. The guy who is serving is really the guy I'm going to honor the most. The lady who was keeping the nursery during vacation Bible school and nobody ever saw her first of all. Those who were handing out snacks, doing uh, the crafts, first of all. People who prepared for things that we never know they did it, 
The Lord sees all of that. Servant of all. And here's this natural, what turned into a carnal desire in his disciples, where they're arguing among themselves, who's going to be the greatest? And he said, you guys need to understand that from my perspective, it's not a title. It isn't your salary. It isn't the size of your house. It's are you serving? Are you a servant of all? And if you're not a servant of all, then you are defining your greatness based upon temporal values. And you've got to get over that as a believer. That's not how we operate. We operate with a servant mindset. To emphasize that, he brings the lowest of their class and puts them in the middle, middle of them and says, you guys, my core group of people, need to become like that child. Wow, that's taking myself way, way down. You mean like a child? Yeah, like a child. You need to become like that. What about this child? Well, one of the same things that he points out is that people are not naturally humble. I love Jim Burke's book, Changed Into His Image, and one of the things that he does in there is he gave me a definition of humility that I'd never really gotten before. And the definition of humility is getting in your place. And if you read the, the chapter, the chapter's titled Getting in Your Place. That is the definition of humility. Humility is simply getting in your place. If you're a humble person, that means that you'll be in your place uh, where you belong in the line or, or realm of people. Uh, a person who's not humble will try to displace the person above them. And if you think about yourself, that's constantly what we're trying to do. Here comes somebody who has a God-given authority. Now, let me use, for example, a parent and child. The parent has a God-given authority. The child is supposed to be in their place. That doesn't mean that they're weak and, and mealy and, and have no character. It means that this person has enough character to say, I'm going to get in my place. I'm going to do what the Lord wants me to do. And instead of battling against authority in your life, you get in your place. Every child had to do that. A child understood if he spoke up to an adult in that culture, he could be backhanded. He was going to be put in his place if he didn't get in his place. He said, guys, you need to get in your place. You need to understand that you don't have a natural bent toward humility. You need to get that. You need to be humble. You need to get in your place. Because you're thinking, I'm in control. I want people to see me. I want to tell people what to do. Not everybody can do that. And humility means that I'm going to be willing to be a servant. And the problem is that when you come down to the last part of this, people are often unsuccessful or unfulfilled by cultural greatness. It doesn't accomplish what they, they want to. They have self-exaltation, but, but they don't have humility. And as you come to the, the end of their lives, they've rejected the biblical view of greatness. They said, I, I, don't, I don't buy into that. You know, this servant thing. I'm not going to buy into that. I've got to make things for myself. I've got to pull myself up by my own bootstraps. Now, nothing wrong with hard work. And nothing wrong with having desires. But it's when you decide that you're going to make yourself great, it becomes a problem. And the Lord is saying, you've got to be a servant. That same article I talked about a minute ago went on to say this. The Heat played in four consecutive NBA Finals. A feat shared with only the league's two all-time greatest franchises, the Boston Celtics and the Los Angeles Lakers. And for that crowd that believes the Heat should have gone to the finals each season with James, Wade, and Bosch on its roster, allow me to explain something. That's not how it works. And he went on to explain that here were people who had put all of their faith and trust that we've got these three men on our roster and we're going to be successful. They were unfulfilled. It didn't happen. Well, they won two, but they didn't win the four that they had planned. Here were these guys who, who said, I'm going to be successful and I'm going to be fulfilled with what I do because I'm going to make it happen my way. And what you have to realize is that you can't plan your own greatness. 
You can't be great because of who you are. You have to be great because you follow God's plan, because you accomplish what he wants you to accomplish. Let me describe a guy to you, and you tell me whether he's great or not. This guy's a deacon in the church. And as a deacon in the church, they run into some persecution in their church, and he ends up being the one to often speak for the Lord and actually preaches a really good sermon. On one particular occasion, after the sermon, he preaches his heart out and preaches a solid biblical <coughs> sermon. And after the sermon, it is very convicting to the people who are there, unsaved people, but they so hate him and his message and his God that they kill him. End of his life. Is he great or not? I described Stephen the martyr to you in Acts chapter 7. And the Lord said, there's a great man. This man probably didn't plan in his life that he was going to preach a sermon and be stunned. <coughs> he simply planned to serve the Lord. And that's what you have to do. You see, the fact is that you and I have to come to the place where instead of thinking, I want to be great or have something great, that I'm going to be great in God's eyes. And in order to be great in God's eyes, I have to take on the mindset that Jesus described. If any man wants to be first, the same shall be last of all and servant of all. In order to be great in God's eyes, it's not that you say, I'm going to be president, and I'm going to win this, and I'm going to do this. It is that I'm going to serve. And perhaps as you serve, God will himself exalt you. But it will take a certain attitude. If you're going to be first, if you're going to be great, you're going to have to serve. And of all the lessons the Lord wanted to get his disciples, he sat them down and he looked them squarely in the eye and he said, Men, listen, you can't be great by obtaining a position. You can't be great by simply conquering the Romans. You're looking at it from a temporal perspective. You will be great in God's eyes when you serve when you serve. And today I'm thankful that there are so many people who have gotten that in our church. It's not exalting myself, it's serving. And today, if you will adopt that mindset, you can be great in God's eyes. You can have greatness, not because of the position that you've got, but you achieve greatness because you adopt the philosophy that God, uh, through his son, gave us. I'm going to be great because I serve. Do you have that mindset today? In just a moment, we're going to bow our heads and we're going to finish our service. And we're going to play through a stanza of a song that you, you know well. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. And will you ask yourself that question? Are you seeking his kingdom first? And if not, maybe this morning is the time that you need to say, Lord, I'm going to serve you. I'm going to stop exalting myself and simply serve. Will you bow with me for prayer, please? And with our heads bowed, in a moment as we come to the place where we finish the service, perhaps you don't know if you're saved. Todd Channel will be in the back of the auditorium in a moment. He and his wife will sit down with you and show you from the Bible where you can be saved if you need to do that. Maybe this morning you want to bow here at the front. You're welcome to do that. But if we can help you, I trust that you'll let us do that. Let's stand together, please. Now, Father, as we're standing before you, we recognize that you've taught us an eternal lesson. And the lesson is clear that if we're going to accomplish anything for you, we have to surrender to you. And so, Lord, I pray you'll help us to grasp that this morning. Help us to achieve true biblical humility by putting ourselves in our place under you. And Lord, I pray that you'll accomplish in and through us what you want to accomplish. Now with our heads bowed, as we play through this song, Seek ye first the kingdom of God. Will you talk to the Lord and say, Lord, here's what you've taught me today, and here's how I'm going to respond. If you need to be saved, talk to somebody, feel free to slip out and, be, and do that. <laughs>